Good afternoon. Welcome to today's conference call. At this time, your lines have been placed on listen only for today's conference until the question and answer portion of our call, at which time you will be prompted to press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Please record your name and affiliation to be introduced to ask your question. Conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I will now turn our call over to our host, Ms. Catherine Hamilton. Ma'am, you may proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Hamilton with NASA's Office of Communications. Engineers and technicians are working through final closeout tasks as well as integrated testing before the Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft roll out to Launch Pad 39B at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the first time in mid-March. At the launch pad, the rocket and spacecraft will undergo one of the final tests, known as the wet dress rehearsal, before launching the Artemis One flight test. Here to talk with us about the recent operations and provide an update on the preparations for Artemis One are Tom Whitmire, Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development at NASA Headquarters, Mike Bolger, Exploration Ground Systems Program Manager at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Mike Serafin, Artemis One Mission Manager at NASA Headquarters. After brief comments from each of our speakers, we'll take your questions. You can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue at any time. Your phones are on mute now and the operator will open your mic uh, when we're ready for you to ask your question and close your mic after you ask your question. We ask that you please stick to one question and identify to whom your question is directed. And shortly after we conclude, you can listen to a replay of this teleconference online. First, we'll hear from Tom Whitmire. Okay, thank you, Catherine. First, I wanted to thank everybody. I know we were slightly delayed today. Uh, we didn't want to interfere with the press conference that just took place. And we'll try to keep it short because there's a lot of global events going on right now. We're respectful of your time. So we'll, we'll try not to spend too much time on this telecon today. It's been about three weeks since we got together. And so I'll talk a little bit about the work that's taking place at the Cape, kind of how we're doing in High Bay 3. I'll turn it over to Mike Boulder. He's going to talk about the actual role event, what's going to take place during the role, and how that looks. And then Mike Serafin, who's here with me, will talk to you a little bit about uh, things that will take place for the wet dress rehearsal. We'll come back and talk to you again right before the roll and give you some updates at that point again. And then we'll talk to you again right before wet dress rehearsal. So we're, we're hoping to have an ongoing dialogue with you so you can ask any questions you have along the way. Uh, with that, let me go ahead and get started. I'm just going to say a few things. When we we talked last, we you know we mentioned that we had some punch list items that we needed to complete on the vehicle. That work's gone very well. They've uh, Mike and his team down in Florida have done a wonderful job uh, completing uh, the necessary work on the vehicle to prepare it for roll. And while we still have some work to do, and I suspect we'll do a little bit more after wet dress rehearsal, for the most part that work's gone very well, and Mike and his team has done a very good job. The other thing we talked about was the flight termination system test, the FTS test. And last time we talked about that, that was the last major test that we needed to do in the VAB before we headed out to the pad. Uh, we just completed the last portion of that test yesterday. We're still analyzing the data from the test, but overall that testing has gone very well. And so we're excited about that for two reasons. One, it is the last test that we needed to do, and the hardware has performed uh, very well, and so we're very happy with that. And the second thing is that by completing that test, that gives us the opportunity to close out the vehicle and prepare it for roll. And so a lot of times in our industry, we uh, aerospace industry, we use nautical terms. I'll probably use a few nautical terms as I describe uh, what's taking place there, just so you have an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, on the SLS, there's, and, and with Orion, there's a number of things we call volumes. And the volumes is interior space in the vehicle. And we go into those volumes to, with uh, men and women, technicians and engineers, to uh, complete uh, integration of the vehicle, which is done at this point. And then we also go into those volumes to actually do test activities. Uh, and what, what we're doing at that point, like when we do an FTS test, we actually go, have to go into the vehicle, through the hatch, through some platforms, out to some avionics boxes, and we'll do an end-to-end -end test for continuity, and we have to be at both ends to do that, inside the vehicle and outside the vehicle. We also use test ports. And so why it's so important for us to have completed the FTS testing is we now have the ability to close these volumes out and get ready for the roll. Uh, the volumes are located uh, up and down the vertical stack. We have a volume in the engine section at the bottom. We have a volume at the inner tank section, which is the, in the middle of the vehicle. We have a volume at the forward segment, which is the top of the LOX tank. We have the L launch vehicle spacecraft adapter, which is a volume, which is where the ICPS is located. And Orion itself is a volume. And each of these volumes, we have a number of platforms. 
And so what they're doing right now is they're closing out the volumes. They're literally backing out of the volume, removing platforms as they go along, and they do inspections. And they'll do a visual inspection and then they take pictures. And what they're doing at this point is they're just making sure that we haven't disturbed anything as we've been in these volumes, doing the work of the technicians and making sure everything's ready to be buttoned up and for us to close the hatch and prepare for the roll. So those are the closeout activities that are taking place right now. That's, a, that's kind of getting ready to, if you, if you go from the nautical uh, motif, it's kind of getting the ship ready to, to go on a journey. Uh, the other thing is that we will, as we close out the volumes, there's a large platforms that we use to access the volumes. These platforms are the size of a basketball court. They're very big. There's 10 of them on each side of the vehicle. They meet in the middle. And so there's 20 platforms altogether. And what they're doing right now is they're clearing the platform. So as we close out a volume and close the hatch behind us, we actually clear off the deck. And what they're doing, there's a lot of equipment we leave on these uh, decks and the platforms to support operations in the vehicle, uh, tables and access points and scaffolding and things of that nature. And they're literally removing that uh, from those areas as we close out the decks. And then the final thing they're going to do is they secure the vehicle. We actually have an umbilical access arm that gets retracted back and held in place. And then we do some final um, efforts with the vehicle to prepare it for roll. And we actually have to transfer from the ground support we have in the VAB to the mobile launcher support that we have, and then we do the roll. So those, those are, uh, Captain, those are the things that we're working on in the vehicle. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and he's going to talk about the actual roll activity that's about to come up. Mike, Mike Bolger. Yeah. yeah, hey, thanks, Tom. Um, and, and just as a reminder, because I know Exploration Ground Systems as a program is a little less familiar maybe than SLS and Orion, but we're the program at Kennedy responsible for the launch infrastructure here, the ground systems and the software. Um, and then we also perform the ground operations, the, you know, the integration, the work that Tom's talking about, the processing and the launch of SLS and Orion, and then the recovery of Orion off the coast of San Diego. So that's who we are. Um, yeah, rollout. So um, something that we've been looking forward to for a really long time. Um, the crawler transporter will transport the it's, – it's over 17 million pound stack to launch Complex 39B. Um, the top of the ML umbilical tower will be about 400 feet off the ground um, when it's riding on top of the crawler transporter. So it's really going to be a sight. First motion in the VAB is planned for early evening. We're targeting 6 p.m. Um, on March the 17th. Um, we normally start rolling at midnight, if you remember from the shuttle program, but we're pulling the start forward a little bit to make it easier for our team and their families. Um, as well as the media and as well as the other stakeholders to be a part of it. Um, it's something that we're all really looking forward to. Um, it takes about an hour if things go well to move from the high bay to just outside of the VAB. Once outside, we retract the crew access arm and head to the pad. We've actually had to extend it just to fit through the doors, the, the enormous roll-up doors on the side of the VAB. Um, from there, it's about an 11-hour trip from the VAB to hard down at the pad. During the roll, we'll utilize a range of speeds. Some are to gather additional engineering dynamic response data. That's one of the tests that we're actually doing as we roll. Um, the speed profiles range from about 0.1 miles per hour, so that's really slow, up to 0.82 miles per hour. The, the slower speeds are for when we're departing the VAB and as we get positioned at the pad, the 0.82 is the cruising speed, if you will, um, and it's used for a significant portion of the four-mile journey. Um, the next time when we roll, when we actually roll out from launch, we'll refer to that four-mile trip as the first four miles and NASA's return to the moon. Um, once at the pad, the team will begin lowering the mobile launcher interface platforms and connecting the mobile launcher to the pad services, such as chilled water, fire suppression, power, compressed air, et cetera. Um, following the pad connects, we'll perform testing to validate mobile launcher to the pad interfaces. Um, then we'll perform some testing that couldn't have been performed indoors inside the VAB, some, some guidance and navigation and control testing and some RF testing. Um, we'll do booster hydrazine servicing, and then we'll get into preps for the wet dress rehearsal. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Serafin. He's going to talk a little bit about um, wet dress rehearsal itself. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so for the wet dress rehearsal, there's a couple of phases to that test. Uh, the first is really the setup phase, which starts about two days prior to the uh, the, the uh, T0 or test window open point. And uh, really what that is is launch site activation. Uh, the, the teams come into the launch control center, activate the, the, um, the consoles that are used to provide command and control. 
team gets settled in and uh, they, uh, they also check out all their interfaces with the Eastern Range. They check out their connectivity with Mission Control in Houston and the SLS engineering support facilities in Huntsville, Alabama, um, and then begin the power up of the rocket and the spacecraft. So that's kind of phase one. Phase two is, is the actual cryo loading operation. It begins with a uh, tanking um, meeting where we, where we meet about uh, eight and a half hours prior to uh, the opening of the test window, and we look at the health and status of the vehicle, we look at the health and status of the ground site, the team's overall readiness, and then the environmental conditions, including weather, if there's any lightning or anything like that before we get into the hazardous operation. So that's kind of phase two. Um, and then, and then we begin the cryo loading, which is which is really the the third phase. And we enter um, a fast fill phase and a slow fill phase, and then and then a stable replenish once we get both the core stage and then the uh, upper stage, the interim cryo propulsion stage, loaded with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And it's it's a multi-step process. Uh, there's fast fill for the core. There's fast fill for the for the upper stage, there's fast fill on the hydrogen side, there's fast fill on the, on the oxygen side, and then we do the same thing with the, uh, um, the slow fill and stable replenish. So it's a multi-step process. And then we get into the test um, activities itself after we've loaded the cryo. Uh, we, uh, we have a unique test setup. Uh, we don't plan on doing this on the real day of launch, but for the purposes of this test, the wet dress rehearsal, uh, we are going to demonstrate our ability to count and then hold within the count inside of the terminal count phase, which is inside of 10 minutes. We'll go down to about a minute and a half. We'll hold uh, for about three minutes, and then we'll demonstrate the ability to recycle back to the T minus 10 minute hold point, um, which is kind of a, 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 a stable set point that we can uh, resume a countdown from. Uh, once we get into the uh, the recycle and are holding at T minus 10 minutes, then we'll, we'll do kind of our, our Fourth and final phase of the uh, of the um, of the wet dress rehearsal, which is the countdown leading to a scrub set of conditions. We'll do a manual cutoff at 9.34 seconds, which is just before we ignite the uh, RS-25 engines. So we're going to get very very late in the count uh, purposefully and demonstrate all the interfaces and and handover from the ground launch sequencer to the onboard vehicle and the automated launch sequencer, and then um, that will initiate a scrub. And then the, the team will detank the uh, core stage uh, cryo as well as the upper stage, you know, cryo propulsion stage cryo, and then safe the vehicle on the pad. So those are those are the activities that we have ahead of us as part of the wet dress rehearsal. In parallel with that, we continue to get ready to fly across the board, and, and the team will be ready to fly when the flight hardware is ready. Uh, right now, we are working uh, through the uh, early phases of our flight readiness review process. I've spent three of the last four weeks sitting through a, uh, a review of the Orion spacecraft uh, that happened four weeks ago, uh, through a uh, review of the Space Launch System rocket that happened two weeks ago, and through a review of our cross-program and interfaces uh, that, that happened last week. Um, I'm very impressed with the team's thoroughness and their ability to communicate um, not only our ability to achieve a mission success, and risk to mission success, but also risk to flight safety. Um, you know, we do fly a, a very energetic vehicle. It's a very large vehicle um, under um, under um, uh, challenging conditions through uh, through ascent and through deep space and then entry and splashdown. And the team has its hands around the uh, the risk that that's ahead of us. And then also in parallel with that, since we have a little more time here, uh, we are. Uh, maintaining proficiency is part of our uh, overall team readiness, and we're conducting a proficiency training activity next Wednesday. Um, and we'll, I'll, I myself will be in Mission Control in Houston with our flight team, our engineering support, our recovery uh, team members, and, and we're going to simulate our uh, uh, three days before splashdown uh, decision gate where we pick our landing site based on weather. So we'll exercise all of our teams, all of our interfaces, and we continue to work together well as a team and, and maintain currency and proficiency, um, again, to be ready to, uh, to execute when the, when the flight hardware is ready. So, so that's it for me. Uh, Catherine, I, I guess I'll turn it back to you and see if, to, if you have anything else to add before we take questions. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and begin the question and answer portion. Uh, please remember to stick to one question and identify to whom it is directed. If we have time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. Again, you can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the queue at any time, and you can enter star two if you'd like to be removed from the queue if, if your question has already been addressed. 
and you'd like to withdraw your question. Um, so first we will go to Gina Sinceri from ABC News. Uh, good afternoon. Just checking in, given where you are with rollout, where you think you'll be with rollout and wet dress, what launch uh, time frame do you think you're realistically looking at? Okay, Gina, this is Tom. Let me see if I can answer that for you. Um, and I think we talked about this three weeks ago. First of all, as you know, um, it was a good question. The um, the what the agency is waiting to do is wait to see when we have the wet dress rehearsal and see how we're doing uh, in terms of the vehicle uh, opportunities for launch. And we'll set the launch date at that point. And the reason we do that is because the uh, wet dress rehearsal is a complicated test. The mobile launcher itself is very complicated. And so we're, you know, we, we continue to evaluate the, the May window, um, but we're also recognizing that there's a lot of work in front of us and we need to make sure we get through that testing and through that um, um, evaluation activity before we set a uh, launch commitment date. Thank you. Our next question is from Kristen Fisher of CNN. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for doing this. My question is for Tom Whitmire, and I know we're supposed to be focused on Artemis today, but uh, given everything that's been going on uh, over in Ukraine and Europe, I wanted to ask you a, a question about the International Space Station and specifically, uh, you know, it, NASA is known for its contingency planning. Uh, Tom, are there any contingency plans in place to allow for continued operations of the International Space Station? If there is a complete rupture in U.S.-Russian relations, as President Biden just alluded to, or actually he specifically said that the Russians are currently on track to do. Yeah, Chris, I wish I could help you out. That's an excellent question. Uh, you know, we're really here. My responsibility is to prepare this vehicle for launch. Uh, so all I can really talk to today is um, the work that we need to do at the at the at the Cape to prepare for the rollout. And from that perspective, you know, we've got all the hardware, the vehicles there. So we're not going to be directly impacted. But I'm only you know one part of the agency, and therefore I can't really answer that question for you. I'm sure uh, Catherine, if you let Catherine know, she could follow up separately, and we'll get the right people to answer the question for you. Yeah, Kristen, you can reach out to me and uh, we will connect you with somebody for an answer. Um, our next question is from Jeff Faust of Space News. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm um, just curious, uh, sort of a nominal timeline, how long do you expect to have the vehicle on the pad for the wet dress rehearsal? And you mentioned you would have some more work to do once you roll it back after wet dress. What sort of additional work would you have to do back in the VAB after wet dress before rolling out for launch? Thanks. I can, I can, Jeff. I'll take a this time. I'll take a initial hit at that, and Mike Bolger will correct anything I'm missing. It's about two weeks between when we get to the pad to the point that we're able to do the wet dress rehearsal. Uh, we'll do the wet dress rehearsal. Of course, it happens a lot to do with happens what happens during the wet dress rehearsal. If we um, have to um, spend any extra time at the wet dress rehearsal, they do some work after the wet dress rehearsal. We get back into the VAB. There's work that we conduct in the VAB, but that period of time between wet dress and going into the VAB and what we do in the VAB is highly dependent on what we see during the wet dress rehearsal. So that's where it's really hard for me to give you a specific timeline. And Mike, and I don't know if you want to add to that, Mike, uh, Mike Serafin. Yeah, um, Tom and, and Mike Bolger, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but nominally it's, uh, it's about a month uh, that we expect to be at the pad between the time that we roll out execution of wet dress and then and then roll back to the VAB. So, as, as Tom Whitmire said, there are there is some variability in that. Um, you know, there's there's some very simple reasons why it may take a little bit longer. Like we could find ourselves um, behind the timeline if if weather conditions are set up for multiple days where the the conditions are are not favorable at the pad. Um, but then there's also the possibility of um, just you know a technical glitch here or there that we'll just have to work our way through. Uh, Mike Bolger, if you have anything to add. And uh, I think y'all covered it pretty well. I think he also asked, you know, kind of what happens after that. I'll, I'll try to talk to that a little bit. Um, so let's see, when, when we get back to the VAB, obviously we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to extend platforms. We're going to reestablish access. Um, we're going to be doing some sensor removals for sensors that were specific to the wet dress test. Um, we're going to do. We're going to be doing the flight termination system um, final battery installations. We're going to be running some confidence tests and checkouts on that system. We've got some late um, crew module stows 
that we're going to do. Um, also in Orion, we're going to be doing a, a, our last battery charge um, and a software load, topping off some GN2. Um, in the, on the second stage, we've got a, a flight computer that we're going to be um, installing um, and running some tests on. Um, and then on the core stage, we've got some antenna closeouts. Um, and let's see, and some foam repairs that that are built into our plan. So um, there's a there's a you know a fair amount of work still to go, but um, you know all things that I think we understand well, um, and and you know we'll look to turn around pretty quickly. Thank you. Our next question is from Irene Clark. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I wanted to ask a question I asked of three weeks ago to see if there were any updates on it, um, if there are any operational constraints for 39A YSLS, is that 39B, or any other operators at KSC or Cape Canaveral, um, and specifically if SpaceX uh, would be allowed to fly the uh, AX-1 mission with SLS at the pad? Thanks. Yeah, Irene, that was a good question, uh, and I think we talked to Mike about that a little, Mike Bolger about that a little bit for today. So, Mike, uh, why don't we go ahead and, 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 and provide the update? Yeah, I mean, really, the, the operational constraint, um, it, while, while they're on launch day at Pad A, um, we'll stand down from activities during the launch window at Pad B, um, and on our launch day, you know, we'll, we'll, there'll be a clear of Pad A as well. But other than that, we really don't have any significant impact. You know, the pads are about a mile apart, um, and so really the only time that we have any kind of a hazard from one pad to the other is actually during the launch window. Thank you. Our next question is from Eric Berger of Ars Technica. Hi, th thanks so much for doing these uh, frequent calls. I really appreciate sort of the updates and, and access to you guys. Um, a couple quick questions. First of all, what are the weather constraints, if any, for rollout in terms of wind, rain, a desire to have a sunset in the background? Um, and then for those of us who may be planning family vacations in June, can you remind us, maybe Mike Serafin, what the window you know, potentially is that month? Thanks very much, y'all. Mike Bolger, you want to do weather constraint? Mike Serafin, you can do window. I know that might be a good way to do it. Yeah, and it probably would be smart to follow up with the with the specific details. We're actually, you know, it's pretty liberal. We we wouldn't start a roll um, with any kind of lightning in the forecast. I think if it's we have a forecast of 10% or higher of lightning, we wouldn't start a roll. I believe the wind constraints are are 40 knots, but I'm gonna I would prefer to follow up, maybe I'll get the information to Catherine that, you know, I, I know you're kind of being facetious about sunrises and sunsets, but yeah, um, that, those won't be a problem, but if we if we get one as we're going up the pad in the morning, the next morning, that would be that would be a, a pretty nice feature of the role, but um, we're not overly constrained um, on our weather constraints regarding role. Okay, and uh, in terms of uh you know, when physics uh, says that we can launch because we have this three-body problem. We've got the Earth uh, rotating on its axis. we got the moon going about the Earth in its, in its lunar cycle, its 28, 29-day lunar cycle, and then we need to head outbound and back, and we need to meet our performance constraints uh, for the rocket in order to achieve that because we are, we are using the, uh, the, the intercrowd propulsion stage on these initial flights. Uh, we, are, we are performance constrained on which days we can go. Uh, we also have constraints associated with the um, Orion's ability uh, to fly through eclipses exceeding 90 minutes for power and thermal reasons, but then we also want to hit a, a, a specific set of conditions at the landing site, uh, specifically daylight, but also our range from entry interface to uh, to a splashdown location, it, it creates another constraint there as well. So when you stack all those constraints up for June, uh, the June launch period opens on the 6th and uh, closes on the 16th. Thank you. Our next question is from Emma Tobin of Associated Press. Hey there. Um, just wondering if you have a date or more specific time frame yet for the roll to pad specifically? Yeah, Mike gave that, but we'll go ahead, Mike. Repeat that, and we'll have this. Uh, we'll have a release out later on. I think we'll get the specifics. So, but Mike will give you the specific date and time again. Yeah. Um, so March seventeenth, six p.m. We're looking for first motion. 
Okay, great. Thank you. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Stephen Clark of Space Flight Now. Hi, Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. Thanks for taking my question. Um, for Mike Serafin, also interested in uh, if you could share the launch dates for July, if you have those available. And uh, just talking about the, the volume of work that you still need to do when you get back into the VAB with the vehicle after the wet dress rehearsal. Um, you know, that sounds like a lot to fit into a month, but maybe I'm, I'm reading that wrong. Is, is that uh, is that one month turnaround in the VAB, um, you know, kind of an op optimistic uh, success oriented schedule or is there any margin in that uh, one month uh, in the VAB? Thanks. Stephen, I'll, I'll take the first part of that, the July launch period, and then I'll, I'll pass to uh, to Mike Bolger on the on the VAB and, see, and maybe see if Tom has anything to add. But uh, as far as the, uh, the July launch period, again, if you take those same set of constraints for this for this first mission, and and when you map that against the the fact that we're flying in this distant retrograde orbit, um, we would. Uh, open that launch period on June the 29th, and it would close on July the 12th. There are a few cutout days in there because of some um, constraint violations, meaning uh, meaning the the rocket could deliver us to uh, orbit and meet the the lunar insertion conditions at translunar injection, but the spacecraft conditions either due to eclipse or um, or the range to entry interface would be violated. Um, so within that launch period that I just gave you, there's there are cutouts on the second through the fourth of July, and then uh, I'll turn it to Mike Bolger to answer the VAB um, timeline question. Yeah, so there is um, quite a quite a bit of work to do, um, and, and what we've learned, you know, I think we talked to some last time, but first time flows, we we always learn some things as we go, so. Um, while we're still really kind of doing the final, I would say, put, putting the cross my T's and dot in the I's on the schedule, um, I, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to say whether 30 days is conservative or not. I guess just because I don't. I don't feel like we have enough. We have baked it enough, if you will. Um, but I, you know, I, I do acknowledge there's a lot of work. I think it'll be in that kind of a time frame. Um, and I think maybe by the time we get to, you know, they talked about two more press conferences. By the time we get to that that second one, I think we'll have a really good feel for that, and we'll be able to tell you more about it. Yeah, and Stephen, this time I agree with Mike. I know it's really, uh, it's a great question. A lot of people want to have a specific date or a specific period of time. I think you're absolutely right. It's a lot of work. Um, we haven't done wet dress so before with this vehicle. I'm really reluctant to, and I know it doesn't, you know, I know it would be easier just to give you a date, but I'm really reluctant to do that. It's not fair to Mike. It's not fair to the team or the vehicle because we really haven't had a chance to send it through a wet dress rehearsal. And so we, we recognize that that's, that that is a, a, a period of time that it could be very challenging. And we would really feel a lot more comfortable and, and being and really more forthcoming with you if we waited until after wet dress. And then I think Mike, like I said, it's not that far from now. We'll be able to give you a much better estimate of the time that's required uh, to complete the work. And, I, and we would feel much more comfortable that we were giving you accurate information at that point. Thank you. Our next question is from Marina Karen of The Atlantic. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm wondering if the persistence of valve problems on Starliner has informed your approach to some of the closeout tasks on SLS. Um, of course, Starliner and SLS are two very different programs, but given that the common thread is Boeing and the fact that you did find a valve issue on SLS last year, have you made any new changes to your process surrounding checking out the hardware before launch? Thank you. Yeah, Maria. Yeah, that's a great question. It's a question, um, not to get any of the details of the situation. You know, we have a, a group of folks that work with us in our chief engineer office across all the programs, and we do share this information amongst ourselves to make sure we're not missing anything. There, anytime anything that uh, it comes across that, uh, you know, another, another program experiences, uh, that we, we, we look at that, and we've had a, a couple of those very specific looks at, at that situation. There was a couple of things actually during that mission that we looked at very specifically. We rely on our technical authority and our chief engineering organization, which is
good to share that information back and forth. We share um, our information with them as well. And so we're, we're, we don't have anything on the vehicle that we currently have a concern on with respect to that situation. Uh, and that would, uh, so we feel very comfortable that we've looked at that. We're aware of the situations that they've experienced. They, they, and when we run into a problem, we share that with other people within the agency uh, just so they have that information. And at this time, we're not really tracking anything in that area. Thank you. Our next question is from Philip Sloss of nasaspaceflight.com. Thanks for taking my question. Um, how much uh, closeout work, so to speak, remains for things like nonconformances and or documentation before you're ready to roll out for a wet dress, you know, compared to the hands-on closeout work that you're doing in the volumes? And how much schedule margin do you have to the 17th? Thanks. So I'll let Mike Bolger uh, talk to that. That's a, it's a good question. Yeah, okay. So so let's see. Um, we have definitely been keeping close track of the paper. We kind of have divided our, I think we talked this last time, divided up into three war rooms where um, we're looking at the paper related to the launch vehicle or to SLS, paper related to the spacecraft, Orion, and then the paper related to the ground systems. So that on the Orion side, there's really just a handful of open items um, that represent constraints were, were really clean. And the SLS side, um, we've, we've got a larger number, and that's really because Tom was talking earlier about the volume closeouts that are going on. Um, and as we do those and as we do the inspections, we, we take nonconformances for lots of little things, um, safety wires nicked, we've got wire chafing, we've got hydraulic fluid on a tape. So little things that are, are pretty easy to address, but um, you know, as we back out of each area, we open we open new work. And on the ground side, kind of the same thing. Although obviously we're not we're not backing out of the volumes. We've got a, um, some paper close out to do. We're closing the documentation and the drawings. Um, I I really don't view it today the paper and the nonconformance close out as the long pole. I really think Tom kind of hit it earlier. It's, it's really going to just be the actual work to back out of each of the volumes, get the platforms out there, um, finish the inspections, and then I guess any new NCs that were to crop up would be what we would deal with. Um, we're currently carrying four days to our March 17th rollout as margin, um, and so, you know, that, that would be the that would be what we're carrying. The reason we don't have more than that is because at this point, like Tom mentioned earlier, that the powered on integrated test and checkout, you know, the more complicated work that we've been doing um, up through the completion of the flight termination system testing is really behind us. And so now it's it's backing out, it's cleaning up, it's you know getting the crawler transporter in place, it's getting the VAB platforms um, pulled back, and it's getting ready for roll. So you know we think that'll be sufficient. Yeah, and we'll let you know. I mean, what we are, uh, I think, you know, Mike's right. We've actually done some preliminary inspections in the volumes and stuff like that. Certainly, if we come across something, we'll get together again. We'll explain to you, you know, kind of what happened. I think that we have some hope that <laughs> that this is a good a good set of data that we're, we're, we're working with here and that we have the right information. Uh, obviously, Mike and his team are doing an excellent job. If something comes up, we'll certainly let you know. Thank you. Our next question is from Tim Bernholz with Quartz. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm curious if the green, or excuse me, if the wet dress doesn't go as planned, is there any scenario where it would be run again? And I understand from our green run conversations in the past that this vehicle can only be tanked up, I think, a single digit number of times. Uh, after the wet dress, how many times uh, can the vehicle be fully fueled and will that affect any mission scenario plan? Thank you. My, uh, uh, first of all, I, I don't, it's, I'd have to think about your question for a few minutes. I mean, obviously, you know, the wet dress is a, it, w w just so you know, when we do wet dress rehearsal, we have launch commit criteria that we have when we fly the vehicle, and then we have criteria we use to use, do the wet dress because we know we're not flying that day. So we've actually, Mike and his team have gone in and we've conscientiously looked at our criteria for the wet dress, and we've, we've really done it in a way that would give us the best ability to complete the test, knowing that if we run into certain situations because we're not flying that day, we can continue to press with the test and get the data that we need from the test. It really depends how far we get into the test. Uh, you know, most situations, you know, we have done a hot fire test at, at Stennis, so we would really have to look at what weren't we able to accomplish, what did we accomplish, what did we already see earlier. But, you know, as a reminder, we're really checking the interface between the vehicle and the ML 
Intel and the launch systems in the LCC. And so it's really situationally dependent in terms of having to do that. In terms of the number of cryo loads, I have to think that what we've reported previously is it's the number is 22. And so it's, it's quite a bit. And so I, I don't really anticipate that that's going to be something that, that's going to catch us, to be honest with you. And even if, if we do that, it really depends. Is it a full load, a partial load? How much pressure did we see? That type of thing. So it's another kind of complicated answer to your question. Um, generally speaking, it's not something we think right now is, is on our radar screen. And Mike, I'll let you add to that. Yeah, so um, Tim, the only thing I would add is, you know, for the wet dress rehearsal itself, um, if we were not 100% on all the planned objectives, and we have kind of primary objectives and secondary objectives, we would we would really just look at the results post-test, which we have a plan to go do that, and then do a risk-based assessment. So the risk to proceeding as is weighed against the risk of repeating the test, and, and there, are, there are some risks associated with repeating the test, um, including just staying at the pad under the, the, the Florida um, environment. Um, we would weigh those and, and decide on a best path forward. So, so it, it's really, to, to reemphasize what Tom just said, it is very situationally dependent. Um, it may be something as simple as just go update some software and a software parameter and we can buy down that risk in a test lab. Um, if it is something that is um, unique to the pad environment and, um, and that's the only place we can demonstrate it, we would look at whether it's appropriate to proceed at risk with a launch attempt or um, uh, and, and get the flight test underway or if we would need to repeat the test. So again, situationally dependent. Yeah, and we did a little bit of that at Green Run too where we made some adjustments between the wet dress and the actual hot fire test. So, um, so it, it really does depend. And uh, Tim, we did do a blog post on the thinking cycles in January of last year, so you can pull that up um, for reference as well. Uh, our next question is from Mike Wall of Space.com. Thank you all. Um, yeah, just 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 a quick question, Tom. Tom, like you mentioned that that you guys are still evaluating the the yeah like the May window. So just just to confirm, is that the earliest window? April is not a possibility anymore. And and can you just refresh my memory? When when does the May window run from and to? Thank you. Yeah, April is not a possibility. We're still evaluating the tail end of May, and the May window ends up in the 21st. Uh, but I, I want to, it goes from the 7th to the 21st of May, but I want to be really careful, once again, being straightforward with you. You know, we really need to get through this next few weeks here, see how we're doing, and I'll have a much, you know, Mike, I, we'll be able to talk to you about it a lot more uh, here as we get together over the next few weeks. So, but to answer your specific question, the May window is completed on the 21st. Thank you. Our next question is from Marcia Smith of Space Policy Online. Uh, thanks so much. I'm wondering, if you look at the entire stack, core stage, SRBs, ICPS, Orion, launch abort system, the whole package, are any of those components from either Russia or Ukraine? And if they are, how many do you have in stock, just in case it's a while before you can get any more? Yeah, Marcia, we're all kind of thinking where you've got us thinking here for a second, Marcia. I'm not aware of anything on the vehicle stack that comes from those countries for this particular vehicle. So I can't think of any, and if I do find one, we'll let you know. I just off, I'm pretty familiar with the hardware. A lot of this is shuttle heritage hardware uh, that we, you know, I used to do the shuttle program, so we're fairly familiar with it. I'm not aware of anything. Mike's kind of shaking his head now as well. Yeah, it, it, yeah I'm, I'm working. My, that's a great question. I'm working my way down the stack. Yeah, we're mentally going and, down and the stack. Like I've, I've, I, either Tom or myself have been to a number of these suppliers. You know, I mean, the boosters are made here in the U.S. The uh, RS25s are made here in the U.S. The uh, RL10s are made here in the U.S. The, the uh, launch abort system is made here in the U.S. Now, the, the, only, the only thing, Marsha, and I should have mentioned this earlier, you know, the service modules provided to us from the European, comes from European countries. It, by the way, it's a very capable service module. We're really happy to have the Europeans as part of our, our – um, and I don't want to not mention them because they're really actually a very important part of this mission they'll be providing. It's a very powerful service module. So we do have European – participation in this, but not, nothing from that I'm aware of from the countries you mentioned. And if we find out differently later on, we'll let you know. Yeah. I, I, I guess the only other part I'll add here is, you know, this we, we get asked about the value of 
NASA and, and the Human Spaceflight Program. And I think the question you just asked, uh, you know, having an industrial base here in the U.S. or with partners that are friendly to us is a is a key uh, element of of this uh, of this enterprise. And and uh, you know, the, the European Service Module, our our uh, upper stage, our our boosters, our core stage, our spacecraft, um, basically provides a, a path for our for our industrial base to have the technology and to have the skill sets, to have the tooling to do this. Because if we did find ourselves in a situation where um, we had somebody out there that, that had a capability that um, we were dependent on, um, we, we've, we've got that here because of this program. Thank you. We've got time for just a couple more questions. Uh, the next question is from Michael Greshko of National Geographic. Hi, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, I think this is primarily from Mike Bolger. Uh, this is the first time that you've reached through this stage in the procedure for SLS and Orion. Um, and from the steps you've sort of recently taken, already are there any lessons learned that will inform or potentially streamline going through these same steps for Artemis II and beyond? Yeah, I mean, any we, you know, when you, one of the things I think we've talked about a few times is a, a first flow is hard, um, and in a first flow, you know, you've got new folks, and you've got new software, and you've got new GSC, and you've got new fly hardware, and, and you're just kind of learning as you go. I think um, maybe one of the things that we've recognized is um, that the, for instance, as we've stacked the boosters. Um, and put the boosters together, there is an awful lot, and really this kind of goes up and down the, the vehicle, there's an awful lot of ablative or the RT-455 that we need to apply, and I think we underestimated um, the amount that we would need to apply and how long it would take. So for a while, we weren't really focusing on that particular piece of the application, um, and, and we got a little bit behind. And then when we got behind, we started kind of looking in to the processes that we used to apply it, and we realized that we had built in an awful lot of government inspection points. You know, when we, when we mix the ablative, um, have we mixed it correctly? Have we mixed it at the right temperature? Um, as we apply it, um, we had a number of government inspection points too. And in effect, we were kind of slowing ourselves down by just the number of times that we were um, performing a, a quality inspection as we perform that work. And, and really, kind of top to bottom, I, th I think we have learned things about our system. We've found issues with our procedures. Um, and, and after each of our major tests, we always stop and we always collect our lessons learned. We write them down as a team and we talk about how to move forward. Another thing we've talked about is um, since, since the KSC team here you know, isn't the design entity for the various flight hardware elements. Um, what kind of presence do we have when we run into a nonconformance? How easy is it to get a hold of somebody and to kind of reach back and get that system expertise? You know, we, we call we call it now ship side support. How do we get the right ship side support to help us get through the process? I think maybe it was I don't remember if Tom or Mike mentioned earlier that for every first flow of a you know major NASA mission. We've always recognized that we're going to learn some things and it's going to take longer than the follow-on flows. And, and we're pretty optimistic that the lessons learned that we're collecting as we go through this are going to really um, enable us to process these you know, faster the second time and then even faster the third and the fourth time to where we turn these around in pretty good order. So um, it's definitely a, a learning process for us. I think we're taking the time to write them down and I think we'll get um, faster as we go. Yeah, and I just have to add a little bit to Mike. I think I owe it to the team in Florida. That, you know, a lot of this work, this, this work took place during the um, COVID pandemic. And, uh, you know, these guys are really, you know, we follow all those CDC guidelines and how we protect our folks. So we have to do contract tracing and stuff like that. But this by no means was, not only was it the first blow, but it was a very um, challenging uh, activity. I think Mike and the team, the technicians that come to work every day at the Cape and, and work on this vehicle, I mean, I can't tell you how proud I am of these folks. Um, you know, that we really have made good progress during a very difficult period of time for really everybody in, in the country and the world. And uh, we're just really proud of them as well. And I think next time on where we really have our fingers crossed that that will be one thing we won't have to deal with. And I think that will help us out a great deal as well. Yeah, hey, 
I'm just thinking one other thing I wanted to add was, uh, you know, when we went through the shuttle program, the farther we got into it, um, we automated more and more software. And then the other thing we did was we documented what we called standard repair procedures. So when we were dealing with um, issues or nonconformances that recurred over time, we had already kind of a built-in place standard repair procedure versus kind of inventing it as you go. And so I think as we continue on with the missions on Artemis, we'll do the same th kind of things. We'll be automating more of the work that we do, and we'll be documenting more of these standard repair procedures, and both of those things will help speed us up as well. Okay. Thank you. We're going to take one more question. I will take it from Will Robinson-Smith of Spectrum News. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, Tom, you just hit on a, a point that I was going to ask about, which is, uh, you know, with the COVID number starting to drop here in Florida, has it helped to uh, expedite the processes that you still have leading up to wet dress and have things started to, uh, I guess, uh, turn a little bit faster now that uh, COVID is becoming less and less of a concern as the days and weeks go on? Thanks. Well, I'll start that and I'll ask Mike Bolger, who's really working the front line on this as well, to kind of add to it. Obviously, it's a tremendous relief, not only to us, but everybody in the country and everybody in the world that these numbers are starting to go down. It was a very significant concern, and we actually had uh, team members that were impacted by this, either with their family or friends or themselves. So, you know, we're very grateful um, that the numbers are starting to go down. I do think it has helped things, and, and I like that Mike, Mike add to that, but it really is an important part of, of what's taking place, and we're really Really are relieved that things seem to be beginning getting better at this point. Yeah, definitely agree. I think I, I talked at the last conference in August and September. We were going through the Delta variant. Um, that one, you know, was more severe, um, and we definitely saw folks go out for periods of time, and it did impact us. We learned some things from that. You know, we learned about. Um, it, you know, when people are at work, not only the, the basic things, but are we wearing face masks and are we, you know, are we keeping social distancing to the extent that we can, but also just about how we conduct meetings, how we, you know, how we have lunch, um, keeping people more apart rather than together. Um, it got a little quieter after the fall here in Florida until after the holidays and then the Omicron hit. Um, it did impact us again because, you know, our folks are spending a lot of time outside of work, too. Um, and so, you know, at, at certain times when those two, when Delta and Omicron peaked, we might have as many as, you know, 100 folks, not who were who were sick, but who had been identified through contact tracing. Um, and so that, you know, impacted some of our crews, particularly if you did have a, you know, a particular area um, get hit at work, we could lose, you know, three or four people from the same area, and that impacted things. But now we do feel like, you know, and knock on wood, I, I know y'all are with me here. We're on the backside of Omicron, and, and hopefully, you know, this is behind us, and we are seeing less of an impact as we move forward. I, hey, I wanted to take an opportunity to answer the question that I didn't completely answer before, and that was Eric Berger asked about the the weather constraints for roll. So I got the I got the data. It's less than 10% chance of lightning within 20 nautical miles. Less than 5% chance of hail or wind, or, or of hail. Wind limits 40 knots or less, and temperature required between 40 and 95. So I just wanted to close my open actions while I had the chance. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's very good, Mike. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll see if Tom would like to make any closing comments. Then. No, I know it's a really uh, a lot going on in the world today. Uh, we appreciate you taking some time and, and, and listening to kind of where we are in the process and asking what I thought was some really good questions. Uh, we'll continue to come to talk to you. We'll talk to you right before the rollout, and we'll spend more information. If there's something else uh, that you want to follow up with, Catherine, fine. I know there's agency will have other, other thoughts concerning the situation, but for us today, hopefully we've answered your questions as best we could. Uh, and we really appreciate your, your having interest in our program. We really are proud of what these folks do. Yeah, I use my uh, uh, nautical uh, expression. You know, it, it's really when you go down to Florida, it's quite an incredible experience. I know a lot of you have done this, and you and you just see um, launches take place periodically. You know, anybody who works in the aerospace industry, I find it fantastically interesting to see something launch into space. It's just, I don't care who it is and for what purposes, you know, if it's coming off Cape Canaveral, it's just an incredible thing. And we're very proud that we'll be the next uh, in line to bring a, a spaceship that is uh, going to go on a voyage all the way out into deep space. It's going to look a little different from the ones you've seen up to now because it's a very big spaceship and it's going to have a really important journey. Uh, we're very proud of what we do for the agency. We're proud of all the folks across the country who've 
uh, added to this program in little communities like the one I grew up in who have people actually who've helped us out over this period of time. Uh, we're very proud to be uh, part of a, an integrated Artemis program that will have the first person of color and the first woman on the lunar surface. I think that's quite an honor for all of us. And we're really proud that, that there's this new kind of future coming forward uh, for this country and this nation and, and everybody on these new launch vehicles that are going to go and do these deep space missions. And we'll be one of uh, probably a few, uh, and we'll have two for the Artemis III mission. And it's really a, a credible time. So you all will get to see this at the rollout. And uh, everybody who I've talked to have really seen the vehicle, particularly once we remove the platforms and stuff, it's going to be spectacular. And we're just very excited about that. And we really appreciate you all taking the time and asking us questions today. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us today. As Tom mentioned, we will have additional calls ahead of rollout as well as wet dress rehearsal. You can listen to a replay of this teleconference online by visiting the Media Resources tab at nasa.gov slash Artemis One later this afternoon. Uh, Artemis One will be the first in a series of increasingly complex missions that will pave the way for missions with astronauts as we prepare for human missions to explore Mars. The SLS rocket and the agency's Orion spacecraft, along with the exploration ground systems at Kennedy, will be the backbone of NASA's Artemis missions to take human exploration farther into space than ever before. To learn more about Artemis and follow our progress to the pad online, visit nasa.gov slash Artemis One. Thanks again, and that will conclude our call. This does conclude today's conference call. We thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect and have a great rest of your day.